Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's live broadcast, Investigating the Role of MicroRNAs in Pancreatic Cancer Progression, presented by Sylvia Ottaviani, Research Associate, Imperial College London. I'm Alexis Krauss of Labberts, and I'll be your moderator for today's event. Today's educational web seminar is brought to you by Labberts and sponsored by Thermo Fisher Scientific. For more information on our sponsor, please visit thermofisher.com. Now, let's get started. Before we begin, I would like to remind everyone that this event is interactive. We encourage you to participate by submitting as many questions as you want at any time you want during the presentation. To do so, simply type them into the Ask a Question box and click on the Send button. We'll answer as many questions as we have time for at the end of the presentation. If you have trouble seeing or hearing the presentation, please click on the support tab found at the top right of the presentation window or report your problem by clicking on the answer a question box located on the far left of your screen. This presentation is educational and thus offers continuing education credit. Please click on the continuing education credits tab located at the top right of the presentation window and follow the process to obtain your credits. I'd like to now introduce our presenter, Dr. Sylvia Ottaviani. Sylvia is an expert in non-coding RNAs, biology, and cancer. She is currently a postdoctoral researcher at Imperial College London, looking at the role of non-coding RNAs in cancers, mainly pancreatic and breast cancers. Sylvia's research has been predominantly focused on microRNAs. However, more recently, she expanded her work on long non-coding RNAs too. Sylvia has recently published her main postdoctoral project in Nature Communications Journal, where she investigated novel microRNAs involved in the TGF beta response in pancreatic cancer. She is also co-author of several publications on microRNAs in cancer, and she is author of two comprehensive reviews on the role of non-coding RNAs in health and disease. For a complete biography on Dr. Ottaviani, please visit the biography tab at the top of your screen. Dr. Ottaviani. You may now begin your presentation. Hello, everyone. Uh, thank you for the introduction, and thank you, everyone, for signing in today. So I am uh, Silvia Ottaviani, um, a postdoc researcher studying the role of non-coding RNAs in cancer, in particular pancreatic cancer. So I'm based at the Division of Cancer at Imperial College London in the UK. And I work in the laboratory of Dr. Leandro Castellano and Professor Justin Stebbing. Today, I'm very excited to talk to you about how our lab is studying the role of microRNAs in pancreatic cancer. And in particular, I will present the results of my first postdoc project that has been recently published in Nature Communications. So let's get started. So pancreatic cancer is a lethal disease with a five-year survival rate of approximately 6%. It is currently the fourth highest cause of cancer death, and it is predicted to be the second leading cause of cancer death in the next decade if outcomes are not improved. Specifically, ductal adenocarcinoma is by far the most common malignancy of the pancreas. Uh, it is indeed the focus of the majority of the research in the field, uh, certainly from our laboratory. So sometimes I will refer to this as uh, PDAC. So the reasons why pancreatic cancer is associated with very poor prognosis are primarily the lack of early diagnosis and ineffective treatment for advanced tumors. Additionally, pancreatic cancer is characterized by remarkable resistance to most conventional treatments, so chemotherapy and radiotherapy, as well as molecular target therapy. Therefore, every research effort to improve our understanding of the molecular mechanisms that drive this aggressive disease is crucially important and will allow development of more effective treatment. So I'm sure you're all familiar with microRNAs. Here I just would like to highlight uh, some important points. So microRNAs are small non-coding RNAs that negatively regulate gene expression through mRNA degradation or translational inhibition. This is uh, just an overview of the biogenesis pathway. So briefly, microRNAs are transcribed as primary microRNAs by RNA polymerase II. 
The prime microRNA is then cleaved by the microprocessor, which is a complex including DROSHA and DGCR8. Uh, this cleavage produces the 6 to 70 nucleotide precursor microRNA. The pre uh, microRNA is then exported to the cytoplasm by exporting 5 and further uh, processed by DICER1 to produce the mature microRNA. So one strand of the mature microRNA is loaded into the risk silencing complex, which directs uh, the microRNA to the target mRNA by sequence complementarity and mediates gene sup suppression, as we said, by either mRNA degradation or translational repression. So microRNAs are fine-tuned modulators of gene expression, and they regulate a variety of biological processes. So perhaps it is not a surprise the fact that this regulation of microRNA expression is involved in cancer. So indeed, microRNAs can function as tumor suppressor uh, and oncogenes. So here on the left uh, panel, we can see a schematic representation of the biogenesis of microRNAs that we just discussed um, in normal tissues. So the overall results is normal rates of cellular growth, uh, proliferation, differentiation, and cell death. In the middle panel, we have an example of a reduction of a microRNA that functions as tumor suppressor. So that leads to tumor formation. So the reduction of microRNA levels can occur because of defects of, at any stage of microRNA biogenesis. Uh, that's why we have these um, uh, question marks and ultimately leads to the inappropriate expression of the um, microRNA uh, target oncoprotein. So the overall outcome may be increased proliferation, um, invasion, angiogenesis, and reduced um, uh, cell death, leading to uh, tumor formation. Uh, in the last panel, we have an example of amplification or overexpression of a microRNA that has an oncogenic role. So this would also result in tumor formation. In this case, increased amounts of the microRNA would significantly decrease the levels of the target tumor suppressor gene and lead to cancer progression. So increased levels of mature microRNA might occur uh, because of amplification of the microRNA gene uh, or a constitu constitutively active promoter uh, or increased efficiency in microRNA biogenesis or indeed increased stability of the microRNA. And those are all indicated by these uh, question marks. What about microRNAs in pancreatic cancer? Um, obviously, as in many other cancers, many microRNAs have been identified and shown to have a role as oncogenes or tumor suppressor. So this is a table of selective microRNAs identified that might be clinical uh, clinically uh, relevant in the management of pancreatic cancer. So as you can see, microRNAs have been identified acting as oncogenes in the top uh, part of this table uh, or tumor suppressor in the bottom part. Um, and they are involved in many different biological processes. I won't go through the list in details. I will just mention a couple. Um, for example, a very well-known oncomere in pancreatic cancer is MIR-21. Um, overexpression of MIR-21 contributes to gemcitabine chemoresistance and enhanced malignancy of pancreatic uh, cancer cells. Um, as for uh, tumor suppressor, a very well-known tumor suppressor is um, the LET7 family of microRNAs. Um, LET7 was found downregulated in a number of pancreatic cancer cell lines, and um, it induces reversion of EMT in gemcitabine-resistant cells. So our laboratory is interested in studying the role of microRNAs in pancreatic cancer tumorigenesis and progression. Here I'd like to point out two important studies that were published in the laboratory. So in the first study, uh, we performed a microRNA expression profiling in pre-malignant pancreatic tumors compared to PDAC in order to identify microRNAs they regulated during PDAC development. So we found uh, many um, microRNA that were downregulated in PDAC compared to low malignant tumors. And we showed that amongst those microRNAs uh, downregulated, 
MIR-16, MIR-126 and LET7D uh, regulate known PDAC oncogenes, uh, so BCL2, uh, KRAS and CRK. Uh, therefore, the downregulation of MIR-16, MIR-126 and LET7D promotes PDAC transformation by post-transcriptional upregulation of crucial PDAC oncogenes. In the second study, we combined data from uh, microRNA and mRNA expression profiling in PDAC cell lines and also in PDAC samples from patients to identify the microRNAs that contribute most to tumorigenesis. So we identified three microRNAs, MIR-21, MIR-23A, and MIR-27A, that acted as a cooperative repressors of a network of tumor suppressor genes that included P, uh, PDCD4, NED4L, and BTG2. In addition, we have shown that inhibition of MIR-21, MIR-23A, and MIR-27A had synergistic effect in reducing proliferation of PDAC cells in culture and also tumor growth in mice. So moving on, we decided to concentrate on specific pathways that are relevant in pancreatic cancer. So this is an overview of the aberrant uh, signaling pathways in pancreatic cancer. It is important to mention that the majority of tumors, um, around 95% of all cases, are driven by mutational hyperactivation of KRAS. So um, this downstream signaling uh, is excessively activated. We decided uh, to focus on the TGF-beta pathway, as TGF-beta has a vital role in PDAC. And at the time, uh, there wasn't a comprehensive study of microRNAs regulated by TGF-beta. So briefly, TGF-beta binds to the type 2 TGF-beta receptor, which activates the type 1 receptor. And this leads to the activation of SMAT2 and 3 transcription factor and they, and they couple uh, then with SMAD4, and they translocate into the nucleus to regulate um, uh, SMAD-regulated genes. So, um, so TGF-beta signaling has a vital role in pancreatic cancer as well as in other cancers. Um, it has a dual role. Um, so it acts as a tumor suppressor in the pre-malignant stages of tumorigenesis and then switches to an oncogene role at later stages of the disease. So the most dominant functions as tumor suppressor are growth inhibition and apoptosis, and the dominant functions as oncogenes are um, EMT, invasion and metastasis, and stemness. So we decided to focus on the oncogene functions of TGF-beta. So how does TGF-beta induce EMT metastasis and stamens in pancreatic cancer? Um, this is a very simplistic representation of the molecular pathway, but I wanted to point out some of the important factors. So as we said before, TGF-beta activates SMAD2 and 3, which in turn form a complex with SMAD4, to stimulate the expression of pro-EMT genes such as SNAIL, TWIST, and ZEB. This leads to a repression of epithelial genes such as e to activate the EMT program. Um, at the same time, the uh, MIR-200 family um, is a very important family of microRNAs. Um, and they've been shown to be very highly expressed in epithelial cells. So they maintain the epithelial phenotype, and they do this by repressing ZEB1 and 2. It has been also shown that uh, MIR-200 family microRNAs act as a stamness inhibiting microRNAs because they suppress pluripotent transcription factors such as B uh, BMI1, SOX2, and KLF4. So simply, the aim of our study was to identify the microRNAs regulated by TGF-beta in pancreatic cancer uh, that had not been identified before. So we wanted to uncover whether microRNAs could add an additional layer of regulation in the complex signaling of TGF-beta responses. 
So to discover novel micronase implicated in PIDA progression through TGF-beta, we created an in vitro cell line model of EMT spectrum. Specifically, we use BXPC3 cells that are uh, very epithelial. Um, then we use PANQ1 cells that are part epithelial and part mesenchymal. Um, then we treated PANQ1 cells with TGF-beta for 72 hours. And as you can see from the picture, uh, the cells treated with TGF-beta, they adopt a more spindle shape and mesenchymal-like morphology. And finally, we have SU2007 cells that are highly mesenchymal. So here on the bottom left, you can see a Western blot for recadering in these lines. And as expecting, you can appreciate that the expression of recadering are inversely correlated with the mesenchymal status of the cells. So next, we performed microRNA expression profiling using Encounter system um, from NanoString. Um, and this is um, a heat map that shows a selection of up and down regulated microRNAs from the analysis. So we confirmed that the MIR200 family members are downregulated in mesenchymal-like cells compared to the epithelial BXPC3 cells. Um, and Excitingly, from the analysis, we found that only two micronase, MIR100 and 125B, increase proportionately with the mesenchymal status of the cell. Um, so we validated these results by qPCR. So here we can see the stepwise increase of the level of both MIR100 and 125B with the mesenchymal status of the cell. And also we can see that uh, these micronase were significantly upregulated by TGF beta. So next, we wanted to investigate the mechanism of TGF beta regulation of these microRNAs. So firstly, we looked at the genomic location and found that MIR100 and MIR125B, together with LET7A, came from the same primary transcript, the London coding RNA MIR100HG. So MIR100HG is a tricystronic host gene for these microRNAs. So our first question was, um, is the TGF-beta regulation of these microRNAs transcriptional? So in order to answer this question, uh, we performed RNA-seq in PANQ1 cells treated with TGF-beta. As expected, TGF-beta significantly upregulated pro-EMT factors and downregulated cell-to-cell junction proteins like ecadering. Interestingly, um, we, um, MIR100HG was amongst the RNA significantly upregulated by TGF-beta. This, therefore, indicates that the induction of MIR100 and 125B by TGF-beta is indeed transcriptional. So the answer is yes. So next, we wanted to investigate whether this regulation was occurring through SMART 2 3 transcription factors. We therefore performed um, chip seq um, for SMART 2 and 3. As you can see from these tracks, you can appreciate that SMART 2 and 3 interact with several regions um, of the MIR100HG gene with strongest binding around the transcription start site. However, we later appreciated that even in the absence of these main sites, TGF-beta was still able to induce these microRNAs, suggesting that SMAT2 and 3 may use other sites more intensively to regulate MIR100HG expression in the absence of the main ones. So even though the regulation of this transcript was more complicated than initially thought, the regulation indeed happened uh, happens through SMAT2 and 3 transcription factors. So the answer of this question is yes as well. So to summarize, we think that TGF-beta activates SMAT2 and 3 that in turn binds to MIR100HG locus and induces overexpression. The, pri uh, the primary transcript is elevated and eventually the mature microRNAs are elevated. This all makes sense except for one aspect. So, um, I told you before that MIR100HG is a tricystronic host gene for MIR100, 125B, but also LET7A. And here's the problem. 
um, we are saying that MIR-100 and 125B are oncogenic microRNAs upregulated by TGF-beta. And LET7A, as discussed before, is a very well-known tumor suppressor microRNA. So any uh, rise of LET7A levels following mir 100 g induction would serve to counteract this effect. So what is going on? We decided to look at the kinetics of those three microRNAs upon TGF-beta treatment. As you can appreciate from this figure, while MIR-100 and uh, MIR-125B increase throughout the time course, LET7A initially rise and then goes back to the initial untreated levels. So indeed, in our, also in our microRNA profiling with 72-hour TGF-beta treatment, LET7A was not significantly upregulated. So this data suggested that LET7A is repressed at the post-transcriptional level by a factor that is possibly regulated by TGF-beta. So a very well-known inhibitor of LET7 processing is LIN28, LIN28 A and B. LIN28 can inhibit LET7 through several mechanisms. It can bind to pri let 7 and inhibit the processing by the microprocessor, uh, or it can bind to pre let 7 and inhibit the processing by DICER, or it can induce degradation of pre let 7 by promoting oligouridylation um, uh, by the tooth um, enzymes. So we looked at our RNA-seq data and found that LIN28B was indeed significantly upregulated by TGF-beta. Instead, LIN28A was, was not expressed at all. So um, we looked at the uh, expression of LIN28B in the same TGF-beta time course and found that LIN28B starts accumulating at six hours. Uh, you have the RNA at the top and the protein level at the bottom. Um, at six hours when LET7A level starts to go down. We also further validate this finding by showing that in knockout cells for LIN28B, TGF-beta was able to induce LET7A levels, um, validating our findings. So before going into details of how these microRNAs affect EMT and stemness phenotype, I wanted to summarize here the main method of manipulation of microRNAs. So there are a wide range of methods that can be used to manipulate microRNA level, and here at least is the one that um, we use in the lab, and in particularly I've used with this project. So in terms of transient manipulation, we have used lipofectamine transfection of uh, precursor microRNAs for overexpression and antimicronase for inhibition. Uh, as for stable manipulation, uh, we used um, uh, precursor microRNA expression uh, lintivectors um, sold by uh, System Biosciences. And for knockdown, uh, we've used the MIRZIP antimicRNA expression lintivectors, um, again from System Biosciences or we use the CRISPR knockout of microRNA locus. In terms of the MIRZIP uh, technology, um, the MIRZIP plenty vectors um, expresses a short alpine RNA that after processing uh, preferentially produces an antisense microRNA. So this results in a stable accumulation of um, antimicRNAs that literally zip the microRNA, leading to permanent microRNA inhibition. So, to evaluate whether these microRNAs regulate EMT, we firstly looked at the morphology upon transient overexpression using pre microRNAs. So, we did this in three different cell lines, and you can appreciate that uh, upon the overexpression, the cells become more spindle shaped, um, a characteristic of mesenchymal cells. We also employed immunofluorescent staining to see whether these microRNAs were acting by reducing ICADIRIN levels. As you can see from the red staining, ICADIRIN is still expressed. However, we observed that MIR-100 induced disruption of ICADIRIN at the level of cell-to-cell -cell junction, and MIR-125B 
promoted a complete delocalization from the junctions. Um, we next looked at the opposite process, so MET, which is a um, mesenchymal to epithelium transition. And in order to do that, we used a stable knockdown uh, clones using MIRZIP technology, and we've used the cells that express these MIRs at the highest level, uh, which are the SUD2007. Um, so as you can appreciate from the morphology, here, uh, the knockdown uh, cells, uh, they acquire a more epithelial uh, phenotype. And also, we use, this, we use these cells to um, assess motility, and we perform the wound healing scratch assay, and you can see that in the knockdown uh, cells for MIR-100 and 125B, the motility is indeed uh, impaired. Um, next, we wanted to investigate the role of these micronase in cancer stem cell formation. Um, so this is because the activation of EMT programs has been associated with the acquisition of stem cell traits by normal and neoplastic cells. So um, the gold standard technique to look at uh, cancer stem cells in vitro is the sphere formation assay. So it consists of seeding cells in low attachment conditions uh, without serum at a very low density. Uh, in these conditions, only cancer stem cells survive, and they would start dividing, forming spheres. So the number of spheres um, is a proxy for stemness. So uh, top left, we have increased number of spheres upon transient overexpression of the mirror. Um, in the left bottom panel, we have reduced number of spheres upon transition inhibition of micronase, and here on the right, again, we have reduced number of spheres in the stable knockdown clones. So what about in vivo? So to assess whether MIR-100 and 125B regulate tumor initiation capacity of pancreatic cancer, we performed a zero dilution um, assay in nude mice using the SUT2007 stable knockdown uh, clones. So you can appreciate that the knockdown showed a strong reduction of tumor regenesis. Um, and here, using the highest dilution, uh, we have formation of tumors in all conditions. However, um, the knockdown cells uh, form much smaller tumors. Next, we looked uh, at metastasis. So this is a schematic of the method that we employed. Um, so firstly, we generated luciferase stably expressing cells so that we could image um, the cells in vivo. Um, we then injected the cells into the spleen of nude mice. Um, cells through the portional vein, we reached the liver, which is the main metastatic site for pancreatic cancer. Um, after one week, we removed the spleen to avoid growth of a primary tumor there, and we tracked the cells by imaging uh, using the IV system. We then sacrificed the mice and performed some uh, ex vivo imaging. Um, this is the bottom of uh, our results. Um, so knockdown for MIR 125B was very effective in reducing liver metastasis. Um, for MIR 100, we noticed a trend, but it was not significant. Um, and this mirrors the effect that uh, we had in our in vitro assays where it seems that the effect of MIR 125B is always um, more significant than uh, MIR 100. Right, then the obvious final question uh, was how important are those micronases in the context of TGF beta response? Meaning, if we inhibit the function of these micronases and we treat cells with TGF beta, are the TGF beta responses impaired? The answer is yes. So here on the left, um, you can see a reduction of sphere formation in knockout um, microRNA uh, clones treated with TGF beta compared to wild type uh, cells treated with TGF beta. And here on the right, you can see that TGF beta, um, the, the TGF beta induced motility is impaired in knockout cells. So in these experiments, we use the CRISPR technology to knock out the microRNAs. 
And briefly, this was our strategy. So in both cases, we used a pair of sgRNAs to disrupt the microRNA locus. So these deletions um, made it possible for the locus to be transcribed, and therefore we had no production of mature microRNAs. Just very quickly, I will touch on the clinical relevance of these microRNAs. So here we performed in situ hybridization for uh, MIR100 and 125B in a collection of 100 PDAC samples and quantified the microRNA expression intensity. So we found that high MIR100 and MIR125B levels were associated with both reduced overall survival and reduced disease-free survival. So, so far, we have shown that these two TGF-beta-regulated microRNAs are involved in several and overlapping phenotypes that could be explained by the regulation of multiple targets. So we've developed a novel approach for target discovery that we called REPUSE. So RNA immunoprecipitation followed by unbiased sequence enrichment analysis. So this method is developed in several steps. Firstly, we overexpress the microRNA of interest uh, in cell lines. In our case, we overexpress MIR100 and NH25B in PANC1 cells. Then we performed in parallel ego 2 rip seq to reveal transcripts that were significantly enriched in ego 2 and RNA-seq of total RNA to reveal transcripts that are functionally repressed by the microRNA ego 2 uh, target interaction. This is followed by unbiased seed enrichment analysis using CLAMR, as is shown here, or C-words uh, algorithms to identify the motifs of microRNA target interaction. Finally, to test whether the uh, motifs identified also inhibit the expression of those genes, we performed cumul uh, cumulative dis the distribution analysis using RNA-seq data. Um, I won't show uh, the results, but basically in our case, for MIR100 and 125B, the three prime UTR of transcripts that were loading onto AGO2 upon overexpression of these MIRs were also strongly enriched with their seed motifs. As expected, transcripts containing the canonical seeds were significantly downregulated compared to transcripts lacking these motifs. So the great advantage of REPUSE is that we can identify direct targets that come from the overlap of ego 2 rip seq data and the downregulated genes from the RNA-seq data. So considering this overlap, we perform pathway analysis using the IPA software. Um, as a result of this analysis, we noticed that these microRNAs were regulating common pathways, including P53 signaling, apoptosis, and um, the role of check proteins in uh, cell cycle checkpoint control. Um, this is just a summary of the microRNA target interaction based on repuse, and also they are grouped uh, in the most significant pathways. So as you can see, microRNAs, these microRNAs regulate many targets um, and are involved in many different pathways. So finally, this is a schematic representation of our proposed model. So TGF-beta via SMAT23 induces transcription of MIR100-HG, which drives up regulation of MIR100 and 125B. We have shown that TGF-beta induces also LIN28B to keep let 7A levels unchanged. These microRNAs regulate many common pathways to induce EMT and stemness, and therefore, PDAC uh, progression. So to conclude, I would like to thank firstly my university, Imperial College London, that allowed me to share my research with you today. Of course, my mentor, Dr. Leandro Castellano, who is a great supervisor and a brilliant scientist and taught me all I know about non-coding RNAs in cancer. I'd like to thank also my co-supervisor, Professor Justin Stebbing, and all the lab members. Uh, those are just the ones that were directly involved in my work and helped me greatly with this uh, publication. I'd like to thank the collaborators that were directly involved in my work, so Dr. Luca Magnani and Prof. Long Yao 
uh, from Imperial College London, um, Professor Christopher Hishin from Bath Cancer Institute in London, and Dr. Elisa Giovannetti from the Cancer Centre in Amsterdam. And of course, I'd like to thank the funding bodies uh, for this study that were mainly Pancreatic Cancer UK and Action Against Cancer. Um, if you want to know more about this work, this is the article describing my project uh, that was published in Nature Communications last May. Um, also, obviously, I'd like to thank everyone for signing in today and listening to this presentation. I'm happy to take any questions or comments you may have. Also, I welcome you to connect with me on Twitter or LinkedIn if you would like to learn about the research in our laboratory at Imperial College. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Taviani, for your informative presentation. We will now start the live Q&A portion of the webinar. If you have a question you'd like to ask, please do so now. Just click on the answer a question box located on the far left of your screen. We'll answer as many of your questions as we have time for. So let's get started. Our first question is, you have showed the correlation of these two microRNAs with overall survival and disease-free survival in patients. Are high levels of these microRNAs also correlated with grade or differentiation of the primary tumor? Uh, yeah, this is, uh, this is actually a great question. And um, yes, we have performed this analysis. Um, so we've done the correlation between MIR-100 and MIR-125B uh, with grade of differentiation um, in the 100 patient samples. So we actually discovered that only high uh, MIR-125B and not high MIR-100 was significantly associated with higher uh, tumor differentiation grade. Thanks for the question. So, of course. Dr. Tiviani, what is the next stage for these microRNAs? Yeah, this is um, an obvious uh, question, I guess. We are very excited about this work. So with this work, we, we found uh, that those two microRNAs could be important target for therapy. So now we are uh, really working to try to bring those targets uh, closer to the clinic. So we are um, setting up uh, a model of nanoparticle deliveries um, in order to deliver those uh, antimicronas. And we are setting up 3D model cultures um, as well, so we can test this uh, nanoparticle on, on 3D model, and eventually we're going to move uh, to in vivo studies. And our next question is, can you expand a bit more on the transcriptional regulation of MIR-100-HG by SMAD2 uh, two and 3? Yes. So, yeah, apology. I, I went um, a little bit quick on that uh, slide. But um, so we, we have basically realized that MIR-100G has a quite complex um, regulation. So um, from the result of the initial SMAT23 chip seek, um, we thought it was quite clear that SMAT23 were str strongly binding uh, at the transcription start site. Um, in fact, I can just bring the slides back so you can follow me a little bit better. So that's slide 14. Um, and then here we go. So we should see the chip seek track now. Um, so uh, so um, yeah, so we, we we've seen this very strong binding uh, the transcription start side. So to ultimately prove that um, these bind these is where the most important region, we um, deleted this region with CRISPR, um, thinking that if we don't have uh, this locus, then obviously when we treat this as with TGF beta, we won't have the induction of the micronase anymore. However. When we did this experiment, uh, after deleting part of the, tr the promoter, we did see low levels of MIR-100-HG and also low level of micronase. But uh, tgf beta was still able to induce MIR-100 and MIR-125B. 
So then we looked actually in detail and we found that actually MIR-100HG has multiple uh, transcription star sites according to, um, we've looked at H3, K27 acetylation um, and markers, and also we could see other SMAT23 binding throughout the transcript. Here you can see in Replicate 2, uh, you can see some other binding, not so much in Replicate 1, uh, but we've checked some uh, chip seq data from um, other laboratories, for example, from uh, PDAC cells isolated from mice, and, and we see clearly multiple uh, binding throughout uh, the uh, MIR-100HG uh, gene. So, therefore, we hypothesized that actually SMAT2 and 3 may use other sites more intensively to regulate MIR-100HG expression in the absence of the main ones. However, we're pretty sure the regulation of this transcript is uh, occurring through SMAD2 and 3. Uh, in fact, we showed that if we knock down uh, SMAD2 and 3 um, by sRNAs, we completely um, uh, abolish the TGFB-induced um, regulation of MIR-100 and 125B uh, levels. Um, and also, we, we show that the, the MIR-100 MIR and MIR-125B level, they start increasing uh, very early after TGF-beta treatment, and indicating that this is a very direct mechanism from TGF-beta through uh, SMAT2 and 3 transcription factors. I hope now, it's Dr. clear Sinyan, now. Oh. <laughs> So you, we're getting some very, very interesting questions right here. So here's going to be our next one. How far away are you from conducting clinical trials in patients with this exciting potential therapy? Yeah, this is um, this is very good question. So we are really working uh, really hard now to try, um, and as I said um, at the beginning, to to, to try to use this. Um, targets um, uh, eventually in, in a clinical setting. But I think that realistically, we're talking about um, a, around 10 years time, I would say, because it, we, we need to set up um, all the delivery uh, system and uh, we need to test it in vitro, in vivo, and then uh, ultimately we can uh, start testing in, in uh, human, so in clinical trials. Thank you. And it looks, and it looks like our next question is going to be, why did you inject the cells into the, into the spleen for pancreatic metastatic assay? Could you explain this model over orthotopic injection of cells in the pancreas? Yes, absolutely. This is uh, this is a very good question. So um, we've. We've decided to do the spleen injection and, um, because it, it's a very um, accepted experimental model to generate uh, liver metastasis. Of course, uh, you can inject cells orthotopically in the pancreas and spontaneously they, um, they will form, you, you wait and then will form metastasis. However, this is, this is a quite long uh, process. So the, the beauty of, of the splenic injection is that it's, it's a very quick assay. So after injection in the spleen, uh, the cells reach the liver within minutes. So I suppose that the limitation of this method is that um, with the uh, splenic Im uh, implantation of cells, um, you, we, we can measure the ability of those cells to grow in the liver but we're not able to look at the detachment of cells from the primary pancreatic tumor followed by invasion um, in, in the stroma. So it is, it is a good method, but it really looks at, um, is, is really looking at, at, at the um, an experimental model of liver metastasis. Yes. SMAD4 is frequently mutated in pancreatic tumors. Perhaps one could hypothesize that the downstream mediators of TGF-beta might differ between SMAD4 wild type and a mutant. Can you tell us the SMAD4 status of the cell lines you have used in the study? Yeah, this is, uh, this is a great question. Um, it's absolutely right. So SMAD4 mutation occurs very frequently. Um, uh, we think around 31% of cases. So in our study, um, the TGF-beta mediating induction of this micronase seems to occur only in PANQ1 and also Colo357 cells. 
and also in um, um, we had some KPC uh, derived cells, so cells deriving uh, from uh, pancreatic um, a pancreatic mouse model. Um, so all of those cells are wild type for SMART4. Um, so we think, um, and, and also when we checked um, the we checked the regulation in BXBC3 and SU2007 cells, um, there is no uh, upregulation by TGF beta, and those cells do not express SMAD4. And we we've shown this experimentally as well. But uh, yeah, this is a very good question. And it looks like we are going to have time for one more question. I'm a bit unclear on why RIP use would offer a significant advantage over more conventional methods. For example, over just combining RNA sequencing, uh, Silomar, and target scan predictions. Yeah, this is, um, this is a good question. So uh, basically, with RIP use, um, so uh, we are talking about combining ego 2 rip uh, with Silamer or C-word and RNA-seq after overexpression of the microRNA of interest, we can obtain accurate identification of direct targets and um, important information also about the type of regulation. So in particular, uh, ego 2 rip uh, um, experimentally identifies the transcripts that are directly bound to the microRNA of interest, and this can happen through canonical or non-canonical um, seeds interaction. If uh, you were to use only RNA-seq, uh, let's say combined with Silamer and target scan, you could miss direct targets that act through non-canonical seed binding, uh, because target scan would only look at uh, canonical seeds. So in addition, we found that if we use Silamer in RIP-seq data, is, uh, it, it gives a very, very good result, and this is much superior at detection of microRNA interacting sites compared to RNA-seq. So in fact, when we tried to, to use Silamer after RNA-seq, we, we didn't see any clear significant signal for canonical uh, microRNA interaction sites. So you cannot in the, identify either canonical or non-canonical sites. And, and finally, I'd say that RIP use is um, allowed to establish whether the identified motives that are canonical or non-canonical are actually capable to downregulate the transcript. Um, for example, uh, alternative methods like LIP and CLASH experiments have indeed demonstrated that some microRNAs could interact with transcripts through seedless regions. But um, because these methods are not combined with RNA-seq, they cannot indicate whether these non-canonical interactions are functional for target repression. So, yeah. Thank you again, Dr. Tiviani. Do you have any final comments for our audience? No, I'd like to uh, thank everyone, and I hope um, this uh, presentation was uh, useful for, for you. And uh, please get in touch if you have uh, further questions or comments um, yeah, at any point or you want to know a bit more of what we do in the lab. Thank you. Before we go, I'd like to thank the audience for joining us today and for their interesting questions. Questions we did not have time for today and those submitted during the on-demand period will be addressed by the speaker via the contact information that you provided at the time of the registration. We would like to thank um, would like to thank Dr. Taviani for her time today and for her important research. We would also like to thank Labert and our sponsor, Thermo Fisher Scientific, for underwriting today's educational webcast. This webcast can be viewed on demand through January of 2019. Labert will alert you via email when it's available for replay. We encourage you to share that email with your colleagues who may have missed today's live event. Until next time, goodbye.